Good morning. I'm Matt Schechner, CEO of Advertising Week, and we are thrilled to welcome you here to the center of the media capital of the world in Times Square at NASDAQ Global Headquarters for the premiere episode of AW360 Live at NASDAQ. Today, we celebrate with our partners from abroad in the United Kingdom, DNAD, and an all-star cast led by a terrific moderator and our media partner for something very exciting called DNAD Impact. DNAD Impact celebrates creativity that makes a difference. And we were thrilled to have the opportunity to be here at NASDAQ with you today. We have a terrific panel and an all-star moderator and Eric Alt, editor of Fast Companies Co-Create. Eric, over to you, thanks. <laughs> thank you very much, Matt. Yes, thank you, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. We have a very distinguished panel here from, uh, from DNAD. We have Tim Lindsay. How do you do? From Droga5, Elaine Purcell. Nice to meet you. Um, from McCann Global Health, Andrew Shermer, and from NASDAQ, Evan Harvey. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, we're gonna talk about creativity, sustainability, responsibility on a global scale. Uh, so to kick things off, kick off the conversation, I mean, global change can mean myriad different things. I mean, it, it covers a lot. Is, is part of finding your niche, is part of it sort of narrowing down what, how you define global change and what it is that you target in your, in your practices? So if we go sort of one by one and just kind of explain a little bit about sort of how your company approaches it and, and maybe if there are specific areas that you, you focus on. Starting with me. Okay. With you. I'm, <laughs> having, I'm having to go Because you are closest. <laughs> happy to go first. We, uh, DNAD is here to sort of serve the global credit community, uh, specifically the advertising and design community. And, and we, one of the things that we campaign for and, and try and uh, stimulate, if you like, is uh, doing well by doing good, a more... Uh, positive attitude to purposeful marketing. Uh, and we, to answer your question, before going off onto a commercial, we certainly take the view that we ourselves at DNAD and the agencies and design studios we support should put their own houses in order before they start dispensing advice to clients. Mm -hmm. So we, we personally work with, a, uh, we, uh, work with a consultancy called Julie's Bicycle, who advise us on becoming uh, a more sustainable business in our own right. Um, I work for Droga5 and I think the way that I approach it, certainly probably more personally on a day-to-day -day basis, is to take a look at how the brands that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis can actually be a force for good in the world. And through creativity, can actually put out into their lives, um, into culture, um, things that often, so often, like if you think about advertising, it's the thing that people avoid. So how can we actually change that and use communications as a force for good? And so it's not just the non-profits of the world, that should be contributing to good. I think there's an awful lot of brands um, that I've worked on and that Droga, Droga 5 works on on a day-to-day -day basis that are clearly contributing uh, to that. Sure. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I'd speak from both our holding company standpoint, which is Interpublic, and the amazing strides that Interpublic has made in the sustainability space from an operating uh, company standpoint, but also uh, I'm in the, health in the health space. And we actually have a practice area called McCann Global Health which is very much about doing work in the developing world around healthcare needs and how that relates to community sustainability. Uh, you can see the thread is definitely there. And so how do we take our core creative um, talent, processes, people, organizations, and focus it on these needs that are at the heart of sustainability? Because healthy communities um, start with healthy people. Uh, NASDAQ, to your question, we work from the inside out. So certainly as a public listed company on our own exchange, we try to be good corporate citizens. We do everything we can in terms of environmental, social, and governance performance as a relatively small but large, uh, small footprint but large brand. And then we work with the listed companies on our exchange, 2,500 or so in the U.S., a lot of them at the top end of the sustainability spectrum uh, in what they do, passing best practices from large cap to mid cap to small cap, trying to get all the companies up to a certain baseline when it comes to engagement on this topic. And then lately, the last few years, it's been a lot of exchange to exchange global work. Basically, can exchanges around the world collaborate on uh, global ESG standards and a, a sense of corporate responsibility that crosses boundaries? Yeah. Now, to that point, um, for an advertising agency, it can be a, your efforts can be a little bit more forward facing because it's the clients you choose, it's the work you put out. But for something like NASDAQ, I mean, how, how, how hard is it to make it visible and is it important? to make it even visible? Like, is that even part of it? I think it's really important. I mean, one of the ways that we make it visible is we represent the needs of investors. Investors for a lot of years now have been asking for more detailed information about the social 
performance of companies, uh, the quote non-financial performance, everything you don't get in the 10Q or 10K. So we think that you know transparency is generally a good thing. We have always been a believer in data-driven sort of decision-making. That's sort of the foundation of our brand and our market model, more and more open sort of uh, participation. And so I think that it's really important that we espouse those values in the markets that we run. And then for the listed companies that we have, um, there's more than just a PR or marketing play here. I think that in terms of how they recruit and retain talent, how they innovate, how they bring people through the senior leadership pipeline, there's lots of bottom line impacts to running your business in a responsible way. Yeah. Uh, now, a, a key element to any of this is credibility. And then that's not something that you can just manufacture. Um, how, how do your sort of individual companies, how do you go about sort of cultivating that, that credibility and maintaining that across all your efforts? You uh, well, like we yeah. one of the ways we do it is, is through something called the White Pencil, which is a, an award in our professional awards, which seeks to award purposeful marketing, people seeking to do well by doing good, which is, by the way, a Lord Leverhulme quote from uh, the late 1890s. And Unilever sponsored us. And I think they're, they're a really good example of people who've picked up this particular baton and, and r run with it. Paul Polman, their CEO, is a, is a fantastic uh, apostle uh, for sustainable marketing. And it's done him, them, and their share price a lot of good. Uh, I think he's a, they're a great demonstration of mm -hmm. the fact that you can indeed do well by at least trying mm -hmm. to do good, not perhaps across the whole 450 brand portfolio, but, but certainly in important areas. So yeah, I'm, we're big fans of them. Oh. They support us. So that's, uh, okay. that's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I think I struggle with this a lot, like on a day-to-day -day basis, helping brands figure out really what's their right to sort of step into some of these conversations. Um, I think it has to come from a place of credibility and authenticity or else the public and consumers will just call, call them out on it. Yeah. I think an example that we've worked on over at Droga5 is the Honeymade campaign, um, This Is Wholesome, where they took, yeah, years ago, I mean, they did it probably three or four years ago now, when they stepped into the arena and the conversation around what is a wholesome family today um, and how is wholesomeness being depicted. And it wasn't your classic white bread, you know, mom and dad and two kids in the suburbs type family. And they took on a topic that felt really true to who they were because they came from a very sincere place, a credible place, and consumers responded so well to it because they knew it was genuine. But they even took the haters as well Absolutely. And, and managed to turn that round to work to in the, bra in, uh, the brand's favor, which yeah. was a really good, really great beautiful. Uh, next yeah. step. You know, yeah. connecting a couple of these dots, uh, at our holding company level and at the McCann World Group level, we, we are beholden to the global compact that we, uh, that we signed to with the UN. So, uh, you know, the big discussion in advertising and marketing today is measurement and analytics and creativity working together. So I, 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 I'll continue to kind of talk about our two frameworks, which is one, we are accountable to the sustainability goals we've established for Interpublic and all its companies. And we're measured on that and we report it. But we've also seen incredible impact from the good work we're doing in sustainability development and public health through the award shows, mm -hmm. through the recognition from community. So now you have young people that work for our company seeing two proof points. One, we're behaving as a progressive, sustainably oriented company by virtue of what I'm told to do every day. And look at the award, we look what we did in Cannes. Mm. Look at the work we're doing in polio eradication, HIV, and other real global issues as an advertising agency network. So we can connect those dots from impact, measurement, to creativity. I will just add that so much brand value, so much global brand value now is quote intangible, 80% by some estimates. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is reputation. It's the way that you're perceived in the marketplace. So this is another aspect of your brand, your reputation, your sort of entry into uh, talent and business deals and suppliers that makes a big difference. Absolutely. Uh, to get back to the concept of, of you brought up the concept of haters. Uh, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're doing like an ad campaign, obviously you're gonna get feedback, you're gonna get people who dislike it. But imagine in the healthcare area, well, I mean, you're dealing with potentially more disastrous uh, mm. uh, pushback in mm. a lot of ways. So I'm wondering, um, how, are the, how are the sort of the, the ways that you sort of maintain those things when you're dealing with different countries, different cultures, different sensitivities? Yeah. Uh, I imagine that must sort of force your hand to be a little bit more creative in how you approach uh, things. No question, because at the end of the day, you have to influence the top stakeholders, decision makers, policy makers, governments, mm. ministries. But we're, all, we're dealing with individual people. We're dealing with hearts and minds. We're dealing with lives. So our belief is that we need to have that toehold of understanding in any community 
around the people we're speaking with and the people we're trying to reach. And you do that with any creative uh, marketing endeavor. But then we also have to look at that top layer of influence and understand that we have to be legitimate in our efforts. Mm -hmm. We have to be absolutely transparent around what we're doing, how and why. Mm -hmm. And more and more, the zeitgeist is show how this is not just philanthropy. Show how you're being a good global citizen by aligning your business objectives with these sustainability goals. And that's a big part of the SDGs. The SDG 17 is about these partnerships. And a lot of that's pointing right at us in the private sector, saying, how are we bellying up to the bar? Just to add to that, it, uh, I, the, the way we think and talk about it at DNAD is, is where the commercial agenda and the sustainability agenda intersect. Mm -hmm. You get really good things happening yeah. because you're not sort of putting anyone's agenda ahead of anyone else's. Right. You've got one agenda. Right. Uh, and that is when really good things start to happen mm -hmm. and actually where business starts to yeah. drive things forward in a way that government has most often shown itself incapable of doing. Sure. Mm -hmm. actually. I've, I've always thought that our, my job or our job in the industry is creative solutions to business problems. Mm -hmm. And so sh not to look at creativity as devoid of actually connecting to the objective at hand, the business objective at hand, but actually as a means to that end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Point. Um, now, as far as uh, you mentioned, sort of recruitment, new new people coming into the business. Um, I mean, the common idea is that millennials and, and even younger are just naturally more environmentally conscious. They're they're more they're more in tune with with global events and global. Are you seeing that it's becoming um, just sort of the norm now? Like people want to not just want to work for companies like this, but kind of like don't see any other option. Like they're well, of course we're going to work for a company that is globally minded and, and globally sustainable. I mean, are you seeing that in your own company? Uh, oh, just, just yeah, a just short word. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sure. I, Sorry. Yes is the answer. And I think more than that, uh, mm -hmm. millennials and you know, their successors, as you say, want some purpose in their professional lives. Mm -hmm. no, not to the exclusion of selling people stuff, in the case yeah. of advertising and design, mm -hmm. but as well as. Well as. And uh, advertising agencies, in our estimation, are finding it slightly difficult you know, a challenge to, to present them with those opportunities. Technology and other companies, other startups are finding it easier because it's sort of built into their startup DNA. Yeah. And there is a, a, t a talent and recruitment issue associated with that in, in the advertising design business. So yeah, I can give you a direct example related yeah. to my very practice. We interview young creative talent all the time and they hear about all that McCann does and all that uh, McCann Health does. When they learned about McCann Global Health and the work we're doing in the developing world, especially millennial audience, says, is there a chance I could work on that if I were mm -hmm. to join? And yeah. there is. Yeah. And that has become an incredible, uh, not only recruitment tool, but retention as well. And sometimes that prize you give the creative director that's been working so hard is, hey, take a crack at this brief. This is something we're doing uh, with an NGO or a government or a consortium around creating real change and they jump at it. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's a scramble to get to work on briefs like, you know, the YMCA that I've worked on for a couple of years now. There's like people putting their hands up all the time to say, like, is, when's that brief coming in? Is there any opportunity uh, for us to work on it, even in our spare time? And so, yeah, I, I think the opportunity to sort of ensure that um, new talent coming in know that that's accessible to them. But like I said at the beginning, it's not only non-for-profit brands that people can work on that will eventually do good. I think you've got to see that opportunity across a whole range of brands. And bring that back into yeah. some of these other sectors. Yeah. Agree. I think that's a great point. I mean, not to indulge in a generalization, but I'm about to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I hear from listed companies, large yeah. and small, is that they, the millennial talent doesn't want to check their values at the door. They want to be expressive. They want to basically live their values at work. They also are really, really adept at social media, so they're excellent witnesses, and they are very good at ferreting out inauthenticity. So mm. if your company is doing something that it shouldn't be or acting in a responsible manner, you have essentially a, a cadre of witnesses <laughs> internally that are yeah. willing to tell you, tell the world about it. But, well, I think this is a, another generalization. I think that the US is better than Europe in general at allowing people time to do community mm. and other projects. Mm. Mm. Again, again, it's something that seems to be more baked in to the, yep. to the yeah. system. It's yeah. a pretty it's prevalent less pr benefit less prevalent nowadays, in, yeah. in Europe, mm. and that's a shame. I think, a really yeah. lovely example of that that I'm familiar with is Droga has this thing called Well Days. And so instead of sort of, if you don't take a sick day, well, you don't take a sick day. So instead of sort of having your sick days, you know, being taken as sort of sick days, they, we are all encouraged to take a well day and actually yeah. go and um, volunteer, find somebody, an organization, and they'll set that, they'll sort of be the conduit to those organizations for you to go and actually use your 
Change your time for good. That's a nice right. idea. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, NASDAQ, you know, itself gives two paid days off a year to go volunteer anywhere you want to in the community. And I know lots of companies that have given as much of a week as a week or two. Yeah. Even sabbaticals where you're going to go yeah. overseas and do something on the company's dime. Yeah. Right. Right. It's interesting that you point out that Europe um, is maybe a little behind America in that because I think the common feeling here is that we are not we're working much harder than everybody else and you know everyone else is taking siestas <laughs> and four hour lunches <laughs> right. and, well. you know and we're the ones <laughs> on our phones all the time but it's interesting to get that perspective that maybe well, believing in uh, uh, stereotypes at all national <laughs> stereotypes uh, I, yeah. I think there are many more similarities than there are differences um, sure. traditionally Americans take less holiday than Europeans but uh, I think in our creative industries at the moment, people are working extraordinarily hard to kind of get the day job done, and that mm -hmm. presents challenges of its own, uh, uh, actually, when it, it comes to the things that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, there isn't a lot of what in, in old money used to be called research and development resource in, <laughs> in ad agencies and yeah. design, design yeah. studios because all that resource is, you know, taken up trying to get stuff done. Well, like and building on that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. building on that, because that's a really critical point. Yeah. Um, the, the companies like ours need to move beyond uh, this is a prize for hard work, so you get to work on something that's pro bono. Mm. Because by virtue of that, you're saying, we are a value proposition, but we're going to drop our value proposition as it relates to these critically important world-affecting tasks. Yeah. So what we've been trying to do, and I'm sure others like Droga have been doing the same thing, is saying, how do we create this so that this is more of our business model? So that doing this kind of work is no longer a luxury, but an incredibly important investment. And, and what companies have that corporate fortitude to say, this is part of our business. This is no longer nice volunteer work we can do when you have time. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, uh, to your point, uh, the idea that there are always witnesses. I mean, you can't sort of keep people at arm's length anymore. Like, mm -hmm. if you do something that's right. a little tone deaf, a little, you're going to hear about it. Right. And, there's no, and there's countless platforms for you to kind of mm -hmm. both reach out, but also get reached out mm. at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the way to put it. I heard this lovely quote, um, vanity trumps privacy. Mm -hmm. And I think, I you know, inevitably social media will sort of crop up where, up where things are potentially not how the public is supposed to see them, if that's the case. And, and the world will eventually actually see if, if, if it's not coming from a very sincere and genuine place. And so, yeah. yeah. But social media, is, social media is also an extremely useful tool because it is allows companies to break down complex global problems like climate change into the personal story. And it also allows companies to tell the story of their brand and the story of their advocacy on this behalf to a much wider audience than they would through an annual report or a press conference or something along those lines. So mm -hmm. there's a good and a, and a bad side to social media on this topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a little bit more of an appetite for works in progress as well. I mean, you're seeing it even in the entertainment space where someone can release an album that isn't really quite done mm -hmm. and they can release a new version and mm -hmm. they can, you could see the sort of honing of the process and I imagine that must filter down a little bit to the creative side where you can take a little bit more risk and if something is maybe just an, a germ of an idea, maybe you can kind of see it foster a little bit yeah. more. It actually raised a very interesting, well, to us in the awards industry, yeah. interesting point, which is, uh, we, we like to award stuff that's real, that's had a real impact in the, in the real world, hence the launch of this new award show, uh, DNAD uh, Impact. But there's also a very strong argument for uh, uh, prototyping, for getting stuff out there, as you've just described, before it's finished and ready for public consumption. Right. Uh, it's a sort of haute couture uh, theory of creativity, mm -hmm. where, where stuff that's never really going to be sold to anyone uh, in the real world has an impact 18, 24, 36 months later. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, much mm. as a Paris catwalk fashion show mm. might, might in, in the high street. So yeah. th it, it poses a problem for award shows because, you know, as I say, wh wh what are you awarding? And we need to get our heads around that, <laughs> write new rules right. to cope yeah. with it, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you bring up sort of work in progress thinking, I think what's a lovely example of that that is so prevalent or emerging now is open source coding, mm. where people are just coming together to collaborate to actually solve a problem that would have taken an awful lot longer if one person had gone away into their corner and sort of put their head down and tried to figure it out on their own. But together, through that technology, people are sort of coming together and like kind of experimenting, you know, fail fast. That sort of spirit and model is actually enabling much faster outcomes, and especially, you know, in the developing world. Well, and at the highest level, we saw in Cannes a couple of weeks ago, the six holding company CEOs holding hands, almost literally, <laughs> we all know Martin, uh, but standing together yeah. and committing to addressing the SDGs. Uh, uh, that, that's remarkable. That's a, that's a landscape-shifting moment in our industry. 
And, and there are the players like David Droga who's been doing this for a while, but to see the leaders of the biggest companies mm -hmm. saying, we're in, that's a defining moment. And leaning it, actually. Absolutely. I, I think there was apparent sincerity in, yeah. in that gesture. I agree. Should we take a minute to discuss what the SDGs are, just in case people don't know? Good sure. point. I mean, yeah, the UN Sustainable point. Development Goals, 17 yeah. of them, global goals to address by 2030, addressing all kinds of problems, uh, climate change, social inequity, economic inequity, water. Uh, poverty, yeah. water, mm -hmm. yeah, all these different mm -hmm. pro aspects of uh, sort of life that are pro troublesome right now. It's a, a very ambitious agenda, but a set of concrete goals that people can get their heads around by 2030 to try, for businesses in particular. Mm -hmm. This is the evolution of what we used to be the Millennium Development Goals, right. which was more of a government operation, but the businesses have been yeah. directly involved in trying to achieve these goals and to pass the responsibility down to their workers. And there's, a, there's a, always already evidence of the advertising industry you know, coming, riding to, not to rescue, because that doesn't yeah. need rescuing, but riding to help and getting, and Richard Curtis has got, uh, who's very involved with, with this uh, Town for Comic Relief, has, has been very clever mm. over mm. his whole charity career mm. at, at uh, getting agencies uh, you know, committed and involved. And uh, there's just a new, a, a new ad to come out using the Spice Girls, what, uh, mm. uh, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Yeah, yeah. Kind of reshot for uh, you know, 2016, it's fantastic yeah. actually. And, yeah. and unlike the MDGs, there's a great effort to push awareness of the SDGs to the entire global population yeah. and not just the stakeholders, advocacy yep. leaders or policy holders, yeah. but everyone. And, and for the first time, you'll actually have kids understanding what the UN states have agreed to in terms of the next 15 years of the world development. Yeah. It's yeah. big. Yeah. Well, this is a good segue into sort of a, a look ahead. I mean, award shows naturally tend to look back a little bit the year that was. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what, what in the next year, near two, what do you see are being sort of the big issues, maybe some of the big areas where, you know, your agencies or other agencies can, can really make a difference? Yeah. A, a, um, a blurring of the boundaries between creative disciplines, I think, is a mm -hmm. huge feature of what is coming down the track. It's already happening. And uh, I'll give you an example that one of the, uh, we gave our top black pencil award and a white pencil to something called Three Word Address, uh, which is done by a digital design agency. And what they did basically was, uh, based on sort of uh, coordinates, they, they uh, mapped the agency into 57 trillion, uh, the, the world, into 57 trillion three meter squares and gave each one a th three word address, which gives the four billion people in the world who don't have an address mm. the ability to get emergency services, have mm. uh, stuff delivered to them, mm. interesting, etc. And it, it's transforming. Country, whole countries are now, uh, Mo Mongolia have adopted it now because they have a, nom a nom largely nomadic population. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it will transform the lives of you know, literally billions of people. And we award it in a award show. It's so much more important than that. But <laughs> that recognition, I think, is also important. And that work could have come from an ad agency. It could have come from a design agency. It could have come from any, mm. any consultancy, yeah. a media, sure. media company, yeah. almost anywhere in our sure. broad you know, industry. Sure. And I think that is going to be a, a big feature of what, of what we see. So yeah, that's yeah. What's my view. Yeah. But the thing that gets me really excited is sort of like how we're moving from information to experiences and how social media is the most social of them all and how virtual reality will truly enable that to become even more so. And I'm not to retrospectively look back, but I think the work that the New York Times did with the virtual reality campaign of within the, the campaign was called The Displaced and brought to life the sort of the, the, the misery that were people in Syria and people sort of migrating into Europe were experiencing, but in this incredibly tangible, visceral way that you could never ever have experienced otherwise. I feel like that's where we're all gonna have to go within our industries to make people who are fortunate enough to not experience that firsthand to really begin to realize what it's actually like. Well, it seems like the timing is, is right. I mean, all these technologies always need that one breakthrough moment. We, we were talking earlier right. about the Pokemon Go phenomenon. Right. <laughs> People are running around with their phones catching Pokemon, but that could be the, the AR breakthrough. I mean, this okay. could be the thing. I mean, it's a very lighthearted thing, but it could be something where like, someone looks at that and like, wait, there's, there are other opportunities here. We can use this because people are willing to engage in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. when someone like the New York Times sends out all these um, headsets that enables people you know, to yeah. sort of experience virtual reality in a way that doesn't seem so scary or mm -hmm. sort of future, then that actually sort of changes the game entirely. Yeah, yeah and I, I agree and, and with both. And building on that, it's this massive feedback loop that is driven by evidence. So when companies are saying we're committed and here's why, so here's what we're going to do, you can get credit for here's what we're going to do, but you get real credit for here's what we accomplished. And so as we start to see results coming out over the next year and two years, especially in our community, when you start to draw a straight line to problem, solution, approach, 
involvement and then the metrics that say you did something, the impact, then we win and then we start to continue to bring people on board. Yeah, our communities definitely intersect in that way <laughs> then because I think that this revolution in the corporate sustainability space will be built on data. Right now we're in an, in an era of uh, mediocre data, a lack thereof uh, on corporate performance and engagement on this topic. I think that it will get better over the next few years. I think stock exchanges are helping to drive that. And I think that uh, you know larger global projects like the Sustainable Development Goals help to put, like I said, big, impossible to digest uh, global problems into uh, discrete buckets that people can sort of process. And that all that performance will be measured with data. Progress will be measured with data. Um, one of the things we also we always like to touch on a little bit is um, sort of horror stories from, from the industry. So when, when you, maybe some of the early days of your efforts, uh, were there any things that you ran into, like brick walls or problems that you didn't foresee in trying to sort of change your whole corporate outlook? Uh, I, I can give you a simple one, and yeah. it's, it's probably been replicated hundreds of times over the last couple of years. Um, we had a, uh, a CEO who said we need to do something in sustainability, hired someone to start to build that program. This person was on board for about six months or so, did an inordinate amount of phenomenal work, built the plan. We were ready to go. Then the CEO left and we got a new CEO and that for the time being was no longer a priority. Now I think, you know, leapfrog to today, I think our goals around sustainability are far and away what they were even at that time of ambition, but we lost some time. We lost a little traction because of that. Uh, just building on that, but from a client, uh, a company perspective, not naming names here, I think even if you've got a huge commitment at the top and in, in the senior team, in really big companies, multi-brand companies, it's very difficult to cascade that. And I think there are, there are big internal communication challenges for, the, for these companies that are attempting you know, to be more purposeful and do well by doing good. Uh, and that needs a lot of work, and you know the agency world can help that as well. Yeah, I think. yeah. and that yeah. top-level commitment, which we now have from the CEO of Interpublic and the CEO of McCann World Group and the CEO of, of McCann Health, so it's it's alignment now, and we are making uh, headway. My uh, my experience with Olivet is when uh, when non for profits who are coming to work with us have so many things that they want to say and that they don't say one thing really clearly. So that feels like sort of a different point potentially, but a lesson that I think all, all sustainability or based organizations or, or brands that are just, you know, with very limited resources should, should learn from, a lesson that is sort of very applicable um, to sort of really focus on what is the one thing that people will, will really need to, to know to change behavior or change um, perception and not try to sort of throw skittles at them because they really only will catch one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, horror stories? <laughs> I don't really have any horror stories. I mean, my experience is basically yours. We haven't had any, you know, street brawls break out no. here in the studio around the topic of sustainability. Generally, the engagement that we do with boards and C-suite is uh, very favorable, very positive. It's only a question of resources or a question of approach, tactics. How do we actually get this number? How do we find the right people? How much uh, time and money do I have to devote in order to be a sort of uh, competent player in the space? I think that the value of the goal is never really in doubt. Nobody is really coming to us and saying, you know, we don't think that these topics or these problems are worth addressing at the corporate level. They all really do. It's just a tactical issue about how they do so. Mm. Can I ask a quick question? What <laughs> were the people think? Sorry, I'm no, not. No, absolutely, no. Go you, I think there's a metric missing in all this, which is what you might call the purpose dividend. So a really simple measurement that allows CEOs to say, in adopting these strategies, we achieve these financial uh, mm. results. And I know measurements do exist around that, but mm -hmm. they tend, I think, to be quite complex and, and a little bit indirect. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to work with research companies to, s to sort of say whether this is an attainable goal or not. And so far it hasn't, it I hasn't don't think been. I don't think they're that elusive or that complex in, in the world that I run in. I mean, we have had lots of studies academically and, and research institutionalized yeah. that tie ESG transparency and outperformance to financial returns, lower shareholder turnover, attraction and retention of talent. I mean, there are hardcore financial metrics that are tieable to, you know, outperformance in this space. And that gets the attention of a CEO. When you can start to put dollars with those achievements, then they start to pay attention. <laughs> right. Just hit them in the wallet, right? That's, that's right. <laughs> Not <laughs> always, most of the time. <laughs> Uh, well, I think, I think that's our time, so I wanted to thank you all for joining us once again, and we're very excited about the uh, PNAD impact, so we'll see where this where that goes this year, and uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.